Hello and welcome to the first of our Google Apps for Education 101 webinar series. Today we'll be covering a Google Apps overview with some information on pitching Google Apps at your school. My name is Ariel Hathaway and I'm a member of the Google Apps for Education team. I'm joined by my colleague Stephen Fang, who is also a member of the team. We'll jump right in and get started. So our agenda for today is the following. First, we'll be going over the benefits of Google Apps. Second, we'll be doing a demo. Third, we'll be talking about pitching Google Apps at your institution. And then fourth, we'll be doing a Q&A session. So we'll jump right into the benefits of Google Apps. The main benefits of Google Apps are outlined on this slide. It's the best tools for students, faculty, and staff. It's reliable and secure, and it's the most innovative collaboration platform. So first, we'll talk about why it's the best tools for students, faculty, and staff. Google Apps for Education provides you with a number of core services that are part of the Google Apps for Education suite. Gmail, Talk, Groups, Calendar, Docs, Sites. These are all part of the Google Apps for Education suite and are available at no cost to your students, faculty, and staff. Um, all of these are also, if you've ever used the consumer, Google services, such as Gmail, Calendar, Doc, the services are going to be much like those that people are already used to using. So the learning curve is very, very low if people already have consumer Google accounts. Additionally, Postini is available. Postini is an additional cost for higher education institutions, but it's a 66% discount for both Google Message Security and Google Message Discovery. And then Postini, um, the GMS service is available at, for free for K-12 institutions, but they do have to pay for the disc message discovery service. So Google Apps for Education, the main high points here, it's free for all your users. There are no ads for students, faculty, or staff. It's a 7.4 gigabyte mail quota, and this quota is growing. It's going to be branded for your domain name, so user at school.edu. Unlike the consumer Gmail, which is going to be, you know, your username at gmail.com, this is branded for your institution. So that, that means that um, you're going to be able to keep the same domain name that you have as you switch to Google Apps. We also have our 24-7 administrator support, which is great because if you run into any questions or issues when you're using Google Apps, you have access to our Google Apps support team to assist you with this. We have phone support for system critical issues and then email support for um, other issues that may arise. And then additionally, this is a more recent development, but a Google Apps account can work with over 50 services, uh, other Google services, such as Picasa, Blogger, Voice. These are services that before you needed a separate Google account to log into, and now you can use your Google Apps account to log into. This can really add value in the classroom as a teacher or professor can use Blogger or something like that sort that they wouldn't have been able to use with just the regular Google Apps account before. And one important thing to note here is that you can turn these on or off so that you don't have to have all of these services on for your users. So now we'll talk a little bit about reliability and security. So hi, everybody. My name is Stephen. We're going to talk a little bit more about the reliability and security of Google Apps. So just so everybody knows, we guarantee a 99.99% uptime SLA um, for your Google Apps for Education. So that means basically your email, calendar, um, docs, sites, all those things should never be down. The picture you see on your right-hand side is actually our Google Apps dashboard, and we actually have a site that you can go to to see the status of all the different applications on, you know, every day. Um, so if there are any issues, You'll be sure to know, and they'll have some more information there for you. Purpose-built infrastructure. So Google is actually one of the world's largest uh, producers and manufacturers of servers. But we don't sell any of our servers. Our servers were created specifically for Google, um, specifically for our infrastructure, and specifically for your information. We have a world-class security team, and our infrastructure, so the Google Apps infrastructure, uh, has been both SAS 70 Type 2 certified and FISMA certified. Uh, so we also provide security for the user. Uh, innovation for security is definitely evolving and something that Google is at the forefront of. Um, Two-step verification. So basically the way two-step verification works is not only do you need to enter a password, 
but it's also connected to something that you own. So, for instance, a mobile device that you'll have to generate a code for um, to then input into the, the two-step verification code uh, form. So basically, for someone to enter your account, they would not only need to have something that you know, your password, but also have something that you have, um, your mobile phone. So this kind of adds an extra layer of security um, to your account. We also have connections over SSL, and we also do have monitor and login activity. Uh, we can showcase a little bit of this later in the demo, but basically with monitoring the login, uh, you can see all the IP addresses um, and kind of from where you've been able to log into things from before. Uh, so the way this would be useful is, you know, if you look through your log and you see that you're logging in from a different country that you've never been to, um, that's suspicious activity. And we do have built-in protocols in place that if we see suspicious activity, uh, we will notify you or suspend your account for you. So privacy and compliance. So for sure security is important to us, but so is privacy. We want to make sure that it's very clear that the content is not owned by us, it is owned by you. Google does not own your data, you own your data. We don't look at your content, we don't share your content, and your content it is not at all affiliated with any of the advertisements. So as the ad systems that we have at Google um, don't run any of your data for Google Apps for Education, um, it's just not used. Um, so no marketing, no advertising, um, no sale of your data. Um, once again, all the data is yours. Um, however, we do have automized, uh, automated scanning um, for protection and personalization. So what we mean by this is your data will be scanned specifically for antivirus, anti-spam, um, different uh, attempts that we might think are phishing. Um, those things will be scanned for. In addition, personalization. So for instance, if you need to search through your inbox, um, Google automated systems need to be able to search through your inbox for you to be able to search your inbox. Another example is priority inbox. Um, for us to know which emails you think are priority, uh, we need to be able to search through your data. Um, but though we do have automated scanning in that sense, once again, it has no bearing on advertisements or marketing. So now we'll go into why Google Apps is the most innovative collaboration platform. So there are some key challenges that we've identified in the education space, and I think that are right, and um, that other people have identified in the education space as well. So one is that collaboration is central. Two is that there's an information overload. And by that, I mean that people are going through, they have a lot of data to deal with, and they need to be able to process that information in a, effective and efficient and smart way. And then three, the ability to connect from anywhere and have your data, even if you don't necessarily have your own computer with you. Collaboration shouldn't have to be a challenge, but when you're emailing attachments back and forth, it oftentimes is. So you can have one version of a presentation that then gets shared to everyone on a team who then creates a new version of that, which then you have to work to put together into the second version, and then again for the final copy. And then if you have one person who didn't do any editing until the end, then you're working on putting that in at the last minute. So this is what we identify as one of the key challenges when you're emailing attachments back and forth. So with Google Apps, you have Google Docs. And Google Docs really allows you to, um, to use real-time editing and collaboration. I can be in a document, and I can see what Stephen's writing in real time, which means that I don't have to worry about, you know, blending things later on. I'm able to see what he's writing. I'm able to see the sections that he's edited and so forth, which makes it really easy to work collaboratively on anything. With Google Apps, you don't have to think about storage. You have seven gigabytes of mail. You have the ability to create 5,000 docs and presentations and 1,000 spreadsheets, and then you have an additional one gigabyte of upload anything. That means you can upload PDFs. You can upload MP3 files. You can upload whatever you want to. You can also access anywhere. You can access from various browsers, 
mobile devices, tablets, and notebooks. So this is important because we want to make sure that you have your, your data wherever you're able to log in from, which means that you can access your data if you're on a colleague's computer, if you're on a friend's computer. And as long as you know your login name and password, then you can access your data. It doesn't matter what browser you're on, what operating system you're on, as long as your Onyx device is able to access the internet. And we have some, these are some snapshots of what the various interfaces will look like if you're on a mobile device. For example, on the top left, you'll see the, um, a BlackBerry with an, an email client in there. So that is what the Gmail interface would look like within, uh, on a BlackBerry, and then versus on the web interface. And then with Calendar, that's the same on the BlackBerry. So one important point to make here is that with various mobile devices, we have different sync settings. So we have a whole page on mobile devices and connecting. So depending on your device, you can connect the most efficient way to make sure that you have your data when you're on the go. Additionally, with um, on the right-hand side, you'll see Google Docs on an iPhone. So we recently released the functionality to edit Docs on mobile devices, which before you had been able to view them, but you couldn't edit them. This means that you can be even more productive when you're on the go because you're able to edit those when you're not necessarily on a machine. We also understand that people are going to have times when they're offline. You're not always going to be connected to the Internet. You may be flying. You, your Internet may be down. And we want to make sure that people are able to access in those situations as well. In order to allow for that, we have offline Gmail calendar. You also have the ability to export Google Docs. So you could export them all to your desktop on your computer if you know you're going to lose connectivity for a while, and then work on those and then upload back into the cloud when you're done, or when you have regained internet connection. Additionally, you can use mail clients that you may already be using. With Outlook, we have Google Apps Sync for Microsoft Outlook, which syncs your mail calendar and contacts and allows you to use Outlook as a front end while using Google Apps as a back end. And then you can use IMAP or POP to connect um, to Apple Mail, Eudora, Thunderbird, any of those mail no, clients. And then one of the great things about Google Apps is that you're on it, a product that's innovative. We do frequent small product updates, and you get the latest and greatest features. It's easy to manage. You don't have to worry about any server or client upgrades that's all going to be handled on our end. You don't have to worry about data migration in order to get the latest and greatest features. Again, that's all handled on our end. Everyone is going to be on the latest release. One thing that we recently released earlier this week is what's new.googleapps.com. And this shows our release cycle, and you can, it also explains how you can opt into a more frequent release cycle, or you can take a release um, approach that you want some more time so that you can update help center articles on your end, you can update frequently asked questions, you can educate your help desk staff before rolling out some of the new features. So I would definitely recommend taking a look at that website to figure out or to learn about our new release cycles and to figure out what is best for your institution and how you can work to create that best experience there. And then as you can see at the bottom of the slide, we have we have a number of releases every every year. So you're going to constantly be on an innovative platform and something that you're able to really um, use to the fullest. Okay, so now we can get into a demo. So let me just open a demo window. Okay. So if you've seen a consumer email account before, then you've seen pretty much what's in what I'm looking at right now. So as you can see, this is branded, so it's Chris at internationalwildcats.org, so you can brand this to your institution. You can also upload your own personal logo for your institution. So this is the Gmail interface. Within the Gmail interface, you can see that you have various labels. So this is the equivalent of what a folder would be in a number of email systems. And I can label things. So if I have a number of emails from Jeff, then I can put Jeff as a label. And then I click on this label, and I can see everything that Jeff has sent. It's really easy and straightforward to create labels, and we can look at some of the settings that you'll see. 
Additionally, you'll see that I have a chat window over on the right-hand side of my screen. So I can use this to communicate with people who, are, who I'm working on a project with. Hey, Stephen. How's it going? He can write back to me, and we have that instant communication. And it's all within the Gmail window, which makes it really simple. So Stephen wrote back to me. We have that instant communication. And you could use it for office hours, things of that nature. So let's take a look at some of the Gmail settings and what people can set on their own. see that there are various settings that people can set on their own. Because they can set the language, they can set maximum page size, how many conversations they want per page, desktop notifications, pictures, things of that nature. This is where you can configure your labels. So you can create new labels here. Um, you can see that I have an Amanda label. Um, basically, they're, they're hidden there, um, and you can decide whether you want to hide or show them in, on the left-hand side of the screen. You also have an accounts label. So I can, um, if I have the ability to send from another address, say for my, I want to be able to send from my Gmail account within here, I can set that up. I can also get mail from other accounts. If I wanted to pull mail in from my Gmail account, I could also do that. Um, additionally, mail delegation is something that we have access to. So you can grant, or that we can, you can grant other people access to. So I can delegate my mail to other users, and that means that they'll be able to um, read my messages and be able to respond on my behalf. So along with labels, we have the concept of filters. And what filters do is they allow you to basically say, I want to find messages that are coming into my inbox that meet this criteria, and I'm going to do something to that. So we can just do a sample. So create a new filter. So I can say I'm going to take anything that has um, that is from we'll just do an example. So from Jeff. And then so we have a Jeff label already, but everything that Jeff says we really want to make sure that we know that it's really important. So we're going to store it. You can also choose to skip the inbox, mark it red, apply another label, forward to an account. And then you decide whether you want to apply to the conversations that are already in your inbox or just the future conversations that are coming in. I can say, start it. I'm not going to apply. But then that filter is there. You have your forwarding and IMAP and POP settings. So this allows you to forward to another address if you want to do that. Also, you can set POP and IMAP settings for if you're going to be using a mail client. With chat, you can decide whether you want to save your chat history or not save your chat history. Um, you can decide what emoticons you're going to be using. Um, you can also call phones, set up voice and video chat. So web clips are contextual information that appear at the top of your Gmail screen, and this is separate from ads, which is important to know. So it's, it can give you some important information. We've also seen schools that have populated this with their own RSS feed, so that, that way that will come up in that web website area. For labs, labs are something that can be either disabled or enabled by the domain admin, but labs enable for um, experimental features to be released in Gmail. And if you have labs enabled for your domain, then your users can opt in or out of some of these features. So, for example, um, we have a Google Calendar Lab that's over on the left-hand side. That's something that can be really useful. Also, the right-hand side chat is also a lab. The important thing to note about labs is that labs are things that are tested. Sometimes will be graduated, but in some cases, if they see that something is not working, then they may take it down while they're working to fix that. Let's take a look at priority inbox. So priority inbox is something that you can opt in or out of. We can take a look at what priority inbox does. But this is really useful because we, in the settings, we tell you how priority inbox works, 
um, how to override things, what, how to really train Priority Inbox to work for you. Offline, it's not in Chrome right now, so I can't show you that, but this allows you to set up um, what offline can do for you. And then themes, users can select their own themes as long as you have this uh, enabled for your users. So you can say, my users can select themes, and then I can really personalize what I want my Google Apps account to look like. I can have Zuzim, Candy, things of that sort, which just makes a more personalized experience. So let's just take a quick look at Priority Inbox. So Priority Inbox will rate things such as important and unread, starred, and then everything else. And if you need to increase the importance of something, you can just simply check it and then mark as important. And the system is going to learn over time and it's going to be able to, it's going to be able to be trained to say, oh, you marked this and it was important in the past, in the past, so we're going to start be, to say that this is important and unread when it comes into the inbox. Let's take a look at Google Calendar now. Okay, so Google Calendar allows you to use what you would have in a consumer Google Calendar account, and this is, but this is for your institution. You can see that I can have different calendars. So right now I can stop displaying this, and this is just going to display my own calendar. So you can see I have econ, um, from 10 to 11, I have a weekly meeting, and various things. So I can really decide what I want to put in my calendar. I can also set settings for who I want to be able to view my calendar. If I don't want somebody to be able to view my calendar, then they don't, they won't have access to view my calendar. I can, I can set the settings specifically to only share out with limited users. So if I have access to other people's calendars, so I have access to Elliot's calendar. Let's pull up Elliot's calendar. So you can see that Elliot has things, so he has an Econ 101 class um, at 2.30 this afternoon. And so this is, depending on the sharing settings that are for the domain and what the user has selected on their own, you can really um, see what other people are doing, and it makes it really easy to schedule a meeting. Let's go ahead and schedule something. So I know that I want to invite Elliot. Obi. So now I can go to the find a time feature. And so the find a time feature will let me look at this and say, okay, this is my calendar, this is Elliot's calendar, and this is Obi's calendar. Now what time will work for all of us? So if I wanted to schedule a meeting for right now at 11 a.m. Pacific time, that looks like it would work for all of us. I can also go through, I can look at a week view. So I can say, oh, this time also works for us on Friday. Set something of that sort as well. If I need a room, we have resources. And we can, we'll go into more depth on creating resources during the webinar when we look into the deep dive into the control panel. But basically here you can set things like conference room, projectors. So if I'm having a meeting at 11 today, I can see that the conference room is available. So I'm going to add this conference room to my invitation as well. So I'm going to say meet, meet regarding physics project. You can also decide whether it's going to be an all-day event. So say it was a conference, you might want to mark that as an all-day event, or if it's going to repeat. I can send that. So I added that meeting, and it, and invitations were sent out to the people who I invited, and then I'll be able to check back and see whether or not it, see it appeared on their calendar, and then they haven't responded yet. But once they did respond, um, I would be able to see whether or not they had responded. So right now they're still awaiting their replies, but they would be full if they had accepted, and they would be crossed out if they did not accept. So additionally, um, depending on the sharing settings, again, that you have set up, then you can go in and add a coworker's calendar. So I can look for a different calendar, and if it's somebody who has granted access to their calendar, then I can go ahead and add that. Let's take a look at some of the sharing settings for calendar. So again, with calendar, you can set the language, you can set the time zone, you can set the time and date format, things of that nature. Um, you can also say whether you want to have weather based on your location. 
You can just select what the default view is, whether you want a week custom view, what that custom view should be. You can also set working hours. So this could be really effective for faculty and staff who need to schedule meetings with students. We could say, you can only schedule things within 9 to 5. Please don't schedule things after 5 p.m. because I want to be home by then. So that in calendars, you'll have a list of my calendars. So my calendars would be calendars that you have the right to view and modify. So this can be a permission that can be granted by another user or if you own a group calendar or something, such as a speak up calendar. And then you also, um, so from here, I, I have my own calendar, so I can say, what are my sharing settings? So I can see here that I have, I'm sharing um, certain details with um, Jeff, Chris, and George. I can make this calendar public, I can share it with everyone in the organization, or I can decide whether or not I don't want to share my calendar. I can uncheck this, and then that means that I'm going to have to share with specific people in order for others to see my calendar. You also have your notification settings. So this is allowing you to say, do I want to have something that's pop up to pop up and remind me when I'm a 10 minutes before a meeting? Do I want to have email notifications for new invitations that come in, for changed invitations, for canceled invitations? So this is something that you can opt whether or not you'd like to receive in your inbox, or whether or not you just like to manage through your calendar. So this depends on the type of user that you are and whether or not what you prefer in that sense. Mobile setup. Again, you can um, notify on your cell phone. You can have an SMS sent to you if you want to. And then labs. Again, there are labs and that allow you to say, I want to try this new thing in my calendar. And then, so some of the ones, you have event attachments that you can use. That means you can upload a, a file to an event, um, things like smart reschedule, how are you going to find a time that works for everyone? You could use something like that. And um, also free busy information, um, when's your next meeting. There are just some really useful things that are in labs that you can use. And then let's take a look at docs. So as you can see, I have a, the, the Google Apps presentation that we were just looking at. That was shared with me. So I was able to share that, and then I present it from this account. So you have the ability to create documents, presentations, spreadsheets, forms, drawings, and then a collection is what would be a a folder on most machines. You can also create from a template. So you can create various templates that um, your your users can select. So and then they can use those to base documents, sites, things like that off of. So as you can see here I have my collection. So I have a CS 101 collection. So in there I have Hello World and an introduction to Python. I have Econ 101, Econ 102, papers, and then I also have this home page. So let's just go and create a doc. And we'll show some of the collaboration. So I'm going to share this with Stephen. I'm sharing with Steven. He can edit this. I'm sharing that with him. I'm going to be titling this. Okay, so it looks like some people um, can't see. Um, let me just. I can just stop screen sharing for a second, and then I'll reshare. Okay. 
Okay, let me just share the application. Okay, so it looks like it's working now. Okay, so Stephen is now viewing the document. So one thing is that we have this chat functionality right here. So we can chat back and forth um, regarding what we're talking about in the document, and then I can also collaborate in real time here. So I can say, I'm doing well. And you. And then I can see where Steven's cursor is. Um, he's going to do top 10 things to do at Google. So let's think about that. So let's say, eat in a cafe. Ride a bike. And as you can see, I can see him highlighting, I can see him typing. So as he changes things around, I'm able to see that. One of the great things, too, is that I can see a revision history. So I can see various revisions at different times. I can see what Stephen wrote, what I wrote. And this just makes it really great in terms of being able to um, be able to see what it is that somebody else is working on and really collaborate on a document together. Okay, so now Stephen is going to do um, sites and groups. So the next uh, few applications we're going to do is called Sites and Groups. Uh, so let's go into Sites first. So what's loading kind of Sites is really our kind of portfolio, uh, really customizable portal type page. So really, you know, Sites is called Websites. Basically, you can create a website without needing to know uh, any coding knowledge. So here on this key club site, once again, you have all those sharing settings. So looking to share it, you can see exactly who you share this site with who can edit it, who can own it. Um, you can choose exactly who can access this data. But basically, when you're creating the site, you, know, you can add your widgets, you can add your YouTube videos, your calendars, your, your forms. Um, you can basically add whatever you need to this site. So we see a lot of different use cases for these sites. So lots of schools now are having e-portfolio pages for individual students, where students themselves can add all the documents or all the other you know, research and things they've done over the years. Um, different stock professors will have sites for their syllabuses or things for them to share with their students. Uh, departments will have sites for teachers to, and professors to share their documents. Uh, once again, as you can see here with the C Club, uh, organizations themselves will have sites as well. Just to kind of give them that, that place of repository to store their documents, communicate, collaborate, and also make it public if they choose to. Sites uh, is very, very, very customizable depending on what use you need it for. And then the next application we're going to actually go into, the next and final application, is Google Groups. Um, so Groups basically allows you to, it's basically our form slash listserv um, type functionality. So the way Groups works is you create a group with different members um, that you want to be in the group. So let's go into this top one-to-one -one group. You go into group settings, um, access, and you can choose exactly how you want this group to be managed. So, for instance, if I create a group of all the undergraduates um, in my, my school, I can then choose who can view my group, um, who can view the members of my group, who can join my group, um, who can post messages to my group. Um, so how this is useful is if I was the IT manager and we need to send an emergency contact out. I want to send it to all the undergraduates at my school, but I don't want the undergraduates to then be able to send messages to each other to abuse that list. So you can have those different granular settings in your groups so that you can administrate it exactly how you want it to be done. A different case, let's say you want to create a faculty group, and you do want faculty to be able to talk to each other. So you can put everybody in that group um, to see uh, so you can see different people in that group to see how that group can be managed. Uh, once again, I think some people are having problems seeing the group site. Um, can people send me a chat to see if people can see the, the group page I'm looking at right now? Oh, 
Okay, we're going to continue. Um, so looking at this group, this group also ties in lots of the different applications um, together. So thinking about it, you can use this group to send an email. So when you send an email to that group, everybody in that group will get an email. If you send a group to that calendar invite, everybody in that group will get the calendar invite. Um, same thing with sites, same thing with docs. So you can use that group as a larger um, group sharing functionality. One other thing with Google Docs that you can do that we didn't mention um, is that, so one of the things that you can create is forms. So forms can be really useful tools if you want to collect data. And if you're a professor, you're teaching a class, and you want to collect information from your students, you can create a form. You can have it be multiple choice. You can have it be check boxes. Um, you can have it be on a scale. So this is something that can really be used um, in really effective ways to get information from students. So if you um, are getting information on how far along people are on their paper, they can have some reform text box um, when they want the due date to be. And then you have data analysis functionality that's also available when things come in, so you can take a look at how people have responded to those. So we found that a lot of schools have found these to be very effective in the classroom because they're able to really quickly send out um, a poll of some type, but you don't have to go through an email to get the results um, that you're getting. So WebEx can be a little bit slower depending on what we're doing. So we're just going to continue, and then we're going to post this uh, presentation so that you can review it later so you have to see uh, what we're saying while we're doing it. Uh, unfortunately for WebEx lag, that's not something that we can change. Okay. So now we've done the demo, so now we'll go into some um, pitching Google Apps, some tips and tricks for pitching Google Apps at your school. So one is, if you're going to pitch Google Apps, we recommend registering for a domain. That way you have your own domain to showcase Google Apps on, what you think the strengths are of the product. And now you'll be able to say, you'll be able to see, or show people how they can use Google Apps in the classroom, outside of the classroom, how students can use it, how faculty can use it. So you can use this, we recommend using a subdomain for your institution, such as vtest.school.edu. If you are going to use a subdomain for your institution, you're likely going to have to speak with the IT staff at your school, which is something that's important to know, as you need to be able to have um, a way to verify domain ownership so the IT staff at your school may need to do this for you. If you want to, the, um, if you want to use something else, you can always buy another domain, purchase that if you own another domain, if you just want to test something around with it. And then you can prepare yourself to demo the Google Apps products and services. So we went over some of the basics of the products and services here. But you can, if you go to learn.googleapps.com, there are great videos teaching you how to use various services. If you haven't used any of the consumer Gmail services or the consumer Google services before, then this can be really effective in making sure that you um, can talk to the various services and know how to do uh, uh, tips and tricks with the various services. This is also a great resource for if you decide to go forward with Google Apps, you have access to this um, as a place to point your users to for training. And then also familiarize yourself with the following pages. So www.google.com slash a slash edu. So this is our EDU-specific web page, and this has information on Google Apps for Education, case studies of schools that have deployed Google Apps, and this is some really great information on how you can use Google Apps at your school. Additionally, from there, there's a link to a security page that's pertinent specifically to educational institutions. There's a security oh. white paper on that page. So if people have security and privacy questions, those are some great resources that you can point them to. And they're very, very um, detailed um, in what they have on them. And then additionally, we have the eduguide.googleapps.com. The eduguide.googleapps.com is a, a website that we recently released that has a guide to going Google for both universities and for K-12 institutions. So you can use this guide to help you through the process. It has deployment plans on there, and it has how to market, and in this webinar series, we'll be going into some of those things in more detail. But this is also a great resource just to study and look into. Um, as when you're talking to various people at your institution, you may be um, asked about certain things, such as the tech technical aspects of a deployment. 
I mean, you can point various people to the sites that are applicable to them. So now we have some time for Q&A. So if you have Q&A related to any of the demos, if you want us to show you anything else in Google Apps, or just the general presentation, please feel free to let us know. And we can go through some of the questions that were already sent. So one of the questions that was came up was, do we have a Twitter for what's new on Google Apps? So at that Google Apps blog spot page, uh, you can follow it on Twitter. Another question is, will we be emailing out the presentation, the link to the presentation? Um, and yes, we will. So we will be emailing out the presentation uh, with the record demo so that you can see things. Listen, we apologize for the lag. Another question is, can we share um, information with people outside the domain? And this is related to calendar specifically. Right, and look, and that's the setting you can choose. So you can choose whether or not you want to share your data outside of that domain. Um, so if you go to your calendar settings and choose um, how you want your calendar to be shared, you can have it outside the domain or you can keep it only within the domain or you can share it with specific people. One important thing to note there is that will also depend on the admin settings that are um, in the control panel. And when we look, so next week we'll be doing a deployment overview and a deep dive into the control panel, so we'll be looking at some of those settings. But those are settings that are set at a domain-wide level, so if your domain administrator opted to not allow you to share information outside of your domain, that would not be something that you would be able to do. Uh, another question regarding two-factor authentication. Um, you do need a mobile phone for two-factor authentication. So if you have a smartphone, there's an application you can use, and if it's a normal, uh, not smartphone, I guess, uh, you can send text messages for uh, two-factor authentication to work. So without a mobile phone, you cannot use two-factor two authentication at this time. Right now, two-factor authentication is something that a domain admin can opt into for their domain, but that a user actually has to opt into on their own. And so it's not something that a domain admin can enforce for all their users right now. So that is an important point to make because somebody who may not have a cell phone um, wouldn't have to do that. And then and if we do release that functionality, you would be able to select which users you want to. The question was, what service of Postini was free for K-12 institutions? Um, so right now we currently offer Google Message Security for free. And what basically Google Message Security is, is more granular spam and antivirus control. So built into Google Apps already is your anti-spam antivirus, the same as if you have a personal Gmail, uh, but for more granular controls over those anti-spam antivirus, uh, you, we do have Google Message Security, and that is free for K-12 institutions. Um, and then there's a question about Blogger and other product integrations. So with Blogger, um, one important thing to note there is that those are the consumer services. So your Google Apps suite is uh, governed by a certain terms of service, and then the, the other services, so Blogger, Picasso, are going to be governed by an additional uh, terms of service. So that's important to note just because um, the support is different. So for consumer services, such as Blogger, that is going to go through the Blogger consumer support, which is mostly forums and places where you can post online. The core Google Apps suite is what's going to be governed by um, RSLAs um, and able to be um, dealt with by our support team if you have questions regarding those. And so that is something that, that's a very important question and something that you want to probably evaluate with your institution in terms of, and just making sure that it's communicated up to your users that if you are using a service that's not part of the core Google Apps suite, that it's going to be something that is going to be best effort troubleshooting on our end or something that you may not have as much troubleshooting into. And um, personal calendar, and would all calendars be synced to an Android phone? So when you um, are using an Android phone and calendar on an Android phone, you get to decide which calendars you're, you're looking at. So um, calendars that you have visible in the web are generally going to be vis visible in your phone, but then you can also go in and select if you want specific calendars to be shown. Um, so I have an Android phone, for example, and I use, I generally just think my calendar, but if I want to go in and look at Steven's calendar, I can opt to do that. So another week question we got was, what are about archived email? Is this through Postini? And what are costs for K-12 institutions? Uh, we do offer Postini for 
all high-end and capable institutions uh, for archiving. It's called Google Message Discovery. We provided a 66% discount for educational institutions. Um, so the cost comes out to be $8.32 per user per year for one year of archiving and $15 per user per year for up to 10 years of archiving. Which is their attention time frame. Okay, will you be adding a control panel feature to enforce or lock down client settings? To allow some lab features by default and block others without having to perform this task manually for each user. So, one thing is, is that for labs, they're going to be available if you opt to have labs enabled for your domain. So, right now, you can have labs that are available um, either for your domain or turn them off. Right now, it's not a... Um, user by user or group by group setting. So that is one thing that's important to know. And if you've noticed with organizational units that released this summer, that allows you to have some different, uh, some additional service on off functionality. So you can say, I want these services to be on for this user. And that is the first iteration of the product. So in the future, there could be the possibility of, you know, having some of those more, I want labs on for these users and not for these users but you're not going to have the granular control over which labs are turned on. It's going to be labs that are on or labs that are off. Okay, are there any other questions? Oh, it looks like, okay. Okay. Uh, there are some other questions in the, in the Q&A section. And so one question is, in what country would our material be stored? What law governs subpoenas? Sure. So the country where your data is stored is not necessarily um, in the U.S. So your data centers, our data centers, are all around the world. Um, regarding what law governs the subpoenas, um, that depends also. Um, so it does depend on who's issuing the subpoena, uh, whether it's a federal subpoena or a state subpoena. Um, you know, though we do have data stored in, in other countries, um, one, your data for sure is secure, um, and that is kind of how um, our systems currently work. Um, if there are specific concerns regarding needing data to be posted in the United States, um, that is something we can further discuss. Um, but as far as we've been dealing with, um, that isn't much of a concern. So the question was, can any school get the SLA signed from Google? Um, so the SLA is actually part of our contract, so it's true for all schools. And um, there's a question about centrally managed contact. So um, sharing contact by a group or globally. So right now, um, if you are sharing contacts, they're going to be shared with your domain. And so you have, we have a shared contacts API, and you can also use the directory sync tool in order to upload these contacts. But those are going to be shared with um, your entire domain. And in terms of sharing contacts per group, that is not something that is currently available. Um, and then there's a question about Google Sites and allowing Google Sites to be public. Um, so you can allow Google Sites to be public. Again, this is something that the admin can decide whether they want to do or not. So you can say whether you want to allow people to post sites publicly on the web. And then and that's a sharing setting within sites that you can select whether it's going to be viewable within the domain and whether it's just viewable to the people who you explicitly share it with or whether it's going to be viewable to everybody. Um, and then one um, in thing that you can also do with um, Google Apps is that, or with Google Sites is that you can um, post, you can do web address mapping. So say, for example, you created your school site in Google Sites, and you could have it the www.yourschool.edu and then have it linked to that Google site. And so, yes, we will be, and there are questions about whether we will be posting this. So we will be posting this recording. Um, later on, and I can send out an email to those who are on, who have registered for the webinar after we've posted it, and, and also we can make sure that we share any additional materials, links, 
um, things of that nature with you so you can have that. If there are any other questions, then let us know now. So we'll be posting information to the um, to our resource center. I can send you all a link to that. And then also I can send us the follow-up email as well with information. Okay, great. So I just want to thank everyone for attending. Um, and so we'll be posting this information and we can send information out. Um, and then also just so next week we'll be doing uh, the A to Z of the Google Apps deployment. So in this session we'll be covering um, deployment plans, how to go about um, the various things that you need to take into consideration. And then we'll, on Thursday we'll be doing a webinar regarding a deep dive into the Google Apps control panel. So how to really make um, the Google Apps control panel work for you and to use that to the best of your ability. Um, and then finally, on the Wednesday of the following week, on March 30th, we'll be doing a marketing and project planning. Uh, in terms of um, how to market your Google Apps if you, are, if you decide to go Google, how can you market this project to your students and to your faculty and staff, and then also um, project planning. So we can take a look at some project plans and how these can be really effective in making sure that everything is completed. Thank you, everyone, for your time, and um, we hope to see you on the future webinars.